Welcome to Stingray Tom's Florida and another Take 5 for Florida History. This is the second video in my series exploring the St. Johns River. The river can be divided into three basins and today I'm back at Tosahatchee Wildlife Management Area. This is roughly in the center of the Upper St. Johns Basin. The terms upper and lower can be confusing, but the upper part of the river system is where the headwaters are and the lower is where the outflow occurs. The St. John's is 310 miles or 499 kilometers long and the upper part is just under one half its overall length, running from the Fort Drum Marsh in Indian River County to Lake Monroe, which lies between Seminole and Volusia counties. With a population of nearly 22 million, it might be hard to believe that you can find a lot of natural areas in Florida, but that's one of the charms of the St. John's River. After decades of exploring the state, I can say I've been in the middle of nowhere many times, and often it's in the vicinity of the St. John's. In fact, nearly the entire run of the river is tucked away from any real population centers until you reach Jacksonville at the end. The river begins in Indian River County at the Fort Drum Marsh. This begins roughly between the city of Vero Beach near the coast and on the shore of the Indian River which isn't a real river, by the way, and Yeehaw Junction, a small settlement near the intersection of the Florida Turnpike, U.S. Route 441, and Florida Route 60. Fort Drum Marsh is a wetlands that's partly a state conservation area and a wildlife management area. It's open to the public and contains a few ponds and a whole lot of wetlands. The northern edge of the marsh is technically State Route 60, but that's not the edge of the wetlands. They continue on the other side of the road and reach north until the first lake and the real start of the St. John's as an identifiable river. The tiny streams that enter Blue Cypress Lake give themselves over to a lake of 10 square miles or 26 square kilometers. Interestingly, even though it's the start of the river and therefore might be imagined to be nearly inaccessible, it's a lake that's easy to get to by car. It's only 11 miles or 18 kilometers from an on-ramp to Florida's turnpike. On its western shore is a small community and Middleton's Fish Camp, the southernmost fish camp on the St. John's. This makes Blue Cypress an excellent tourist spot to see aspects of natural Florida. You can take airboat rides, go fishing for Florida largemouth bass, hop on a slow pontoon boat to see ospreys and eagles prove how much better they are at fishing than humans, and see gators show a lack of concern that you're passing by. Of course, as we head north on the river, there will be many other opportunities to experience all that, but I'd like to think it's extra special on Blue Cypress since it's really just a low spot in the wetlands which births the St. John's River. At the north end of this vaguely kidney-shaped lake is a canal, ramrod straight and heading due north. This is officially the St. John's. For various reasons, primarily flood control, the state wanted to have a solitary channel that was carved into what is still the wetlands that began a few miles south in the Fort Drum Marsh. When you look at this area on a map, it's pretty easy to notice that the canal runs directly west of a rectangular reservoir, nearly the same size as Blue Cypress. Notice that the St. John's, the canal, doesn't enter the reservoir known as Stick Marsh. This continues to be part of the flood control work of the state under the administration of the St. John's River Water Management District. Stick Marsh is connected with the Fellsmere Reservoir and Recreation Area. This is a popular fishing area. On any day, nearly 100 bass fishing boats can be spotted on these marshy, interconnected bodies of water. From there, the canal continues north until due west of the small town of Malabar in Brevard County, the St. John's is allowed to split. 
partly continuing due north as a canal, but also to the northwest as a fairly natural channel through the marshland until it reaches a lake that has a reputation larger than its size. Named Lake Hell and Blazes, it's occasionally listed as the headwaters of the St. John's, though clearly it's not. That name, which is sometimes given a G-rated version, Lake Helen Blazes, is probably 90% of its fame. As easy as it is to drive to Blue Cypress Lake, it's impossible to get to Hell and Blazes except by small boat. It's said that the name is directly tied to its lack of accessibility, but since it was known as an excellent fishing spot, people were willing to spend the time to get there. Prior to the 1970s, the lake was larger, but agriculture encroached onto the wetlands and canals began to drain Hell and Blazes. Heavy rainfall would wash heavily fertilized water from the nearby farms into the lake, and it didn't take long before the fish died and invasive hydrilla and water hyacinth grew out of control. Today, the lake might truly be accurately named. Not only is it hard to reach, few even want to end up there. Continuing north, we reach Sawgrass Lake, yet another now polluted body of water which is located just south of U.S. Route 192. I touched on US-192 in this video. The highway runs east to west, ending in the middle of the state just west of Walt Disney World. This makes Sawgrass Lake and Camp Holly, the second fish camp on the St. John's, one of the easiest spots of the St. John's that Disney vacationers could visit. This part of the river is no longer a canal, and while there are additional tiny channels in the wetlands, it has grown into a real river. Too shallow for large boats, of course, but it's no longer so narrow that it feels mildly claustrophobic. This is also where the river gets into larger lakes. This area feels lonely as the fishing isn't great and there's not a lot of boat ramps. It's one of the best places on the river to disappear and become surrounded by nature. There's plenty of birds, gators, and turtles, and you can hardly see the water move. Remember, throughout its run, the St. John's drops only one foot in every 10 miles. Still in Brevard County, the St. John's passes under US-192 and eventually enters Lake Washington. It's a bit smaller than Blue Cypress at nearly 7 square miles or 17 square kilometers. It's roughly oval and lies directly west of Melbourne. Indeed, it's only a mile and a half away from Interstate 95. Melbourne is the first city of any size that comes close to the river, even though the single road that connects the city of 76,000 with the lake ends at a water treatment plant and a small county park. So even though Lake Washington and of course the river are just a few blocks away from the city, the area continues to feel remote, especially if you're out on the lake. The most recent time I was there, I watched as a military helicopter perform maneuvers in the middle of the lake. From Lake Washington, the river flows into the River Lakes Conservation Area and enters Lake Winder, like hell and blazes, and is in the midst of wetlands. A few miles north is Lake Point Set. Narrower and longer than Lake Washington, it's about the same size. Like each lake since hell and blazes, it's polluted, and there are fish kills from occasional heavy rains which push contaminated runoff from adjacent farms and cattle ranches. Much of the land on the west side of the river at this point, and really for dozens of miles north and south, is owned by the Church of Latter-day Saints. Known as the Deseret Ranches, the various parcels owned constitute the largest cattle ranch in the U.S. with 470 square miles or 1,200 square kilometers of property, much of it on and within the wetlands of the Upper St. John's. Lake Point Sets is the first lake since Blue Cypress to have homes on its shore, albeit only about a hundred of them. At the western tip of the lake, as it once again becomes river, sits the Lone Cabbage Fish Camp. It's on State Route 520, which runs from Cocoa Beach to the Orlando area. This is one of the more popular fish camps on the St. John's, with a restaurant and live music, as well as airboat rides. It's popular because of the proximity of the small city of Cocoa, but also because it's at this exact point where the nature of the St. John's changes. 
For the next 27 crow flying miles, the river not only lacks any appreciable lakes, it rarely has an obvious main channel. Lone Cabbage, therefore, connects with the large lake as well as the streams to the north. At this point, the river passes through the Tosahatchee State Preserve and Tosahatchee Wildlife Management Area. The series of streams and channels that comprise the St. John's here are very shallow, often less than a meter deep, and the bed of the river, if you can call it that, is up to a mile wide. There are always cattle dotted along the streams eating the grass. Once again, these are residents of Florida's productive cattle lands, and that's somehow hard to imagine in Florida. When you think of states that raise large numbers of cattle, Florida doesn't typically come to mind, yet it ranks 10th in the U.S. in beef production. This is the least developed part of the river, at least since its origin. It's hard to describe this land, but it's kind of raw and unfinished. I love this area of the river, as I've mentioned in other videos. One of my favorite aspects is the smell. No, it's not a pleasant smell. It's the smell of muck. Muck is a type of soil that is made up of organic material that is or has been in the process of decomposition. It's waterlogged and as it decomposes in the brutal Florida sun, an odor rises. There's few unmistakable scents in the world and to me, Florida muck is one of them. The river crosses under State Route 50, which connects Titusville and Orlando, and passes by the Orlando Wetlands Park. The city of Orlando describes Orlando Wetlands Park as a man-made wetland designed to provide advanced treatment for reclaimed water from the city of Orlando and other local cities. It's 1,650 acres, or 6.5 square kilometers in size, and is open to the public. It's located just to the west of the St. John's in Christmas and is open for wildlife viewing, hiking, photography, and bicycle and horseback riding. It's one of several facilities that allow for the final treatment of wastewater before it's returned to the environment. At this point, that's the St. John's. The park is a great place to see wildlife since much of the land is open. Brush and forest are kept under control so that the city employees who manage the site can keep tabs on how water flows between the ponds. There are numerous trails in the park, and it's common to see more than a dozen species of birds within an hour. I've seen deer, opossums, turtles, raccoons, and quite a few gators, though I can't recall ever seeing one larger than eight foot or so. Not surprisingly, larger gators are much more common out on the St. John's, and this part has some of the largest number of gators on its run. Obviously, it helps that the river is divided, so there's more room for an animal that is mostly aquatic in nature. The broad sandy shores of the many streams also allow for some of the best basking spots in the state. Ride through the area not long after dawn and you'll see dozens of contented gators. For more info on gators and where to find them in Florida, see this video I made last year. Since we're back to the St. John's, we'll next cross under State Route 46 and re-enter the realm of large lakes. At 46 is C.S. Lee Park and the Jolly Gator Fish Camp. Much like the Lone Cabbage Fish Camp, it sits at a transition point, the final one in today's journey. Just beyond Lee Park lies the entrance to Lake Harney. Harney is barely developed with only a string of homes on its southwestern shore. We've now moved into Volusia and Seminole counties as we traverse what is the second largest lake so far at 9 square miles or 23 square kilometers. Still, Blue Cypress is the champ. Harney is kidney shaped and the St. John's pours out the north end. After passing through the Tosahatchee area, the river has become less polluted. Harney is a fairly clean lake with a decent fish population. While it can be partly attributed to the land that the river has gone through since the previous lake, another reason for its purity stems from the fact that Harney is fed by springs. While the river exits Harney on the north end, it begins to move mostly westward. We are back to one main stream, though there are still quite a few smaller channels. Directly west of the top of Lake Harney is the next lake as we come close to Route 46 once again. At Cameron Wright Park, 
the river reaches a T. While the right-hand direction heads downstream, I want to quickly point out the left-hand direction. Passing by the park, this part of the river enters the wide mouth of Lake Jessup. This lake is particularly interesting in that the St. John's both feeds and drains Jessup from its mouth. The lake has several streams and springs that feed it, including Soldier Creek, which passes not far away from Big Tree Park, one of the area's oldest attractions, which you can learn about in this video. Jessup is the largest lake we'll see in the Upper St. John's. It's just under 16 square miles or 40 square kilometers. That's about one and a half times the size of Blue Cypress. It's also the only lake along the St. John's that has a bridge directly across it. That'd be State Toll Road 417. Like all of the other lakes I've mentioned, development on the shore is very limited. From the outflow of Jessup, it's just a short trip northwest to Lake Monroe, our final stop in this video. Firstly, here's a view of the only marina on the upper St. John's before we get into Lake Monroe. As you may remember if you saw the intro video, Lake Monroe is the dividing line for the upper and middle St. John's. This is for one simple reason. Lake Monroe is the most southerly part of the river to have been navigable by steamboats that travel the St. John's. I'll cover Lake Monroe and of course the city of Sanford in the next video in this series. I could point out that the Upper St. John's is mostly a wild run, but in reality the middle part is also fairly wild, so that's not what makes the upper portion unique. The Upper St. John's goes through several dramatic changes. The string of pearl-like lakes and the wetlands where it all but dissolves into marshy streams that remind me more of a river delta. Parts are excellent for fishing and it's all excellent for wildlife viewing. The main limitation for it being a major tourism draw is its relative inaccessibility despite only being a few miles from several small cities. The Upper St. John's should be appreciated more by visitors, both Floridians as well as vacationers from abroad. Of course, it'd help if the state would finally invest in cleaning the area up and protecting more of the fragile adjacent land. There's no question that this part of Florida's greatest river is beautiful and awe-inspiring, though too few people appreciate it as such. Thank you once again for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please hit the like button and subscribe to my channel to learn more about Florida's tourism history. Stingray Tom's Florida, traveling through time around the Sunshine State.